previously on Classroom Hacks. And remind myself that I'm teaching, but there's a larger view of reality that I have in place. Everyone does. Everyone has a world view. And how does my teaching or the reasons why I'm teaching fit into that larger world view? And then I bring that to my students by saying, and I don't give them my views. I don't sit there saying, here's what I think. You should think it too. And I, I tell them that a, the goal of the class is not agreement, but to become better thinkers and to try to make wiser choices uh, as a result of thinking better. Because <laughs> I tell them the wiser, the more wiser choices, the more wise choices we make in life, the better chances we have to find some happiness in this difficult life. Good morning to all of you who are listening to our podcast bright and early this Monday morning. As a reminder, new episodes of Classroom Hacks debut every Monday. So for those of you who are living with anger or sadness that the weekend came and went, there is always solace in knowing that you have a brand new episode of Classroom Hacks ready and waiting for you like the cutest, warmest, cuddliest, most reliable puppy. Now that I've successfully created an association between Classroom Hacks and Fuzzy Puppies, let's talk about today's episode, Old Habits and New Technology. We're often told that we teach what and how we were taught. This usually holds true as we tend to model our behavior based on the practices and methods that we've seen work and are memorable. However, many modern instructors are recognizing that we are living in a time where we have tools and materials unlike any point in history. Modern technology can not only rejuvenate a classroom, it has the ability to completely change it into something incredible. So today, we examine the practices and traditions that have stood the test of time and have proven valuable for many instructors, while conversely, we also observe new aspects of technology that can potentially be the future of education. As always, sit back, relax, and we hope you enjoy Episode 9 of Classroom Hacks, Old Habits and New Technology. Discouraged at the technical difficulties, I came home saying, honey, I need to find a new podcast partner. I know, it's like, <laughs> you're going through all the things, you're like, oh, there's these audio issues. So there's, I emailed there's this, Mike Dusick. Yeah, like there's these audio issues, there's things going on, and she's like, maybe the problem is your partner. That's what she said, she says, wedding Eric yeah. needs to wed now. And like, then, what does that even mean? And you were like, you're absolutely right. And two days later, I got a divorce. <laughs> Mike, so what do you think of today's students? Uh, they're a bunch of apathetic blobs of protoplasm. Thanks, Mike. All right, very good. Now we'll... Uh... <laughs> My new partner, Mike Dusick. Speaking of newness, this is episode nine of Classroom Hacks, Old Habits and New Technology. And before we get into that, we are live from the Pantheon of Pedagogy, the Mecca of Methodology, your vacation from vacation with your commute companions, where you can seriously learn to take teaching not so seriously. This is, and we are Classroom Hacks. Pedro, how you doing? Good, good. I'm Peter Canetis. Just for the audience, maybe they haven't heard us before. Yeah, if, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome. I'm Eric Tan, and we've been doing this now for, if you're listening to this, nine episodes. Our ninth episode which actually wow. sounds crazy because we we started last summer and we make nine episodes sound like you know we're we're mash like this is our ninth episode ninth we've been episode. doing this so long i know we go for quality over quantity exactly so we're we're like a quality band and we're a quality artist and we're trying to give you the best quality possible over an extended amount of time i mean we aim for quality that's our goal right yeah aim- excellence i mean we'll leave it mm-hmm. to the audience to to see if we're giving giving them anything valuable. Right. Aim as low as you can so when you reach for your goals, you hit the dirt. That's that's the old saying. That's that's a little – that's depressing. That is. That is kind right. of sad. Is that from a movie? No, that's just from the the emptiness of my life. Pedro is, is, is getting his his uh, his pre – Me, ma, mo. Podcast exercises and So today – Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> Sorry, I was just warming up. There you go. 
So today we are talking about old habits and new technology. And one of the things that tends to come up is that we are we are moving forward, things are changing, things are evolving, we're learning new things about the classroom, we're learning new things in education, we're learning new ways to teach. And one of the, the conflicts that tends to come up is we want to integrate new technology, we want to integrate new sort of teaching methods, but at the same time, we don't want to discredit the things we've learned, the things that we've inherited from our predecessors, because those things are important. But ultimately, what do we do when we try to gain that balance in the classroom? And one of the, the quotes that is often said in this sort of modern teaching world is about Google. And it suggests that students can learn on Google in four months, or I'm sorry, four hours, what they could potentially learn in one class an entire semester. And so that sort of quote makes us realize that we have to step up our game, but we also need to hang on to the things that we deem important. So Pedro, if you kind of want to take us back to when you were taught, how you were taught, what were some of the things that you were taught in your classrooms or when you were a student that you saw your teachers do that you thought were beneficial, that you thought were good teaching methods that you still sort of incorporate today in your classrooms? Well, the first thing I thought of, even before I get to your question directly, is the part about Google and finding answers and finding everything out quickly. Growing up, and now this reveals my age, I'm older than you, Mr. Young Eric, my Google as a kid was the card catalog and the Dewey Decimal System in the library. So that was, we didn't have the internet back then. And so uh, I grew up as a, uh, as they call it, a technological immigrant. I was oh, not born, I was, yeah. Is, I was that not, a, is that one of yours? Is that your no, one? I didn't make that up. I forgot where I got that from, but someone said to me one time, yeah, our students are, are technological natives or technology natives as opposed to technology immigrants. Mm, interesting. So I grew up with a rotary phone as a kid. I remember as a little kid, that was our first phone, a rotary phone. We had a rotary phone too. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I... Well, and then I, you, you had to walk all the way from the kitchen to the living room if you wanted to keep in the wire. Yeah, and then you, you could, could even go. go to the store to buy yeah, a longer exactly. wire. And if the phone came off the wall or if it was on a table, you can take the phone with you. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Or going use it to, to yeah. use it to discipline, you know, the kids if the they kids. got out of line. Oh boy, we're gonna get some bad uh, emails <laughs> we're gonna on get that some one. Feedback from that. Maybe we'll cut that one out and edit it. So you know, is, regarding what I was taught or the methods that teachers used, say, and we're talking all like K through twelve, right? Yeah, and anywhere even, you want to. Yeah. College? yeah, even college. Yeah, it was always when they just. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I have anything new to to add that no one's thought of or no one does. Well, we're just talking about some of the things that you've seen from your time as a student yeah. and when those, what you inherited from those things, whether that was lecture, whether yeah. that was types of homework you got, whether that was different types of learning that you did, what were some of the things that you experienced growing up in the classroom? That I found beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the main ones was when the teacher offered a problem, and yeah. I don't mean just math. Sure but say it was history or science or English class, et cetera, they offered uh, a problem. It could be a moral dilemma. It could be uh, a problem based on the content we are, we're studying that week. And so when we had to solve a problem individually or together, I mean, who doesn't love to be active? And so that made us active in the classroom rather than just passive listeners. And I mean, don't get me wrong. we heard some great lectures and have benefited from that as well. But it was the stuff that stuck with me and that I incorporate, or at least try to, in my teaching is uh, active learning as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Toss out questions, toss out problems for them to work on, and then we discuss together. If you've ever been to one of Pedro's classes, one of the things that he is excellent at He's a very good rhetorician. He's a very good speaker. If you can't tell by the podcast, his voice is always much more amplified than mine. And I don't even have to use the amplified effect on him. He just has that sort of presence. Were there certain instructors that you had growing up, teachers, instructors, college professors, that were very good orators that you can remember that, or at least something from their class that you, that you sort of strive to be like? Yeah, there were. I mean, there are dynamic teachers, and I had some of them growing up. One of the teachers I have that sticks out in this area was in high school. My 
guess this is my sophomore year, and it was my uh, health teacher. Interesting. So we all had to take health, and now this is, we're talking decades ago, so I'm trying to remember the details in terms of, okay, I think it's sophomore year. You had to take health, and is it okay if I say his name? Yeah, that's, yeah. Up, that's totally up to Yeah, you. I mean, it was, this is a compliment. This is not yeah. bad stuff. This is good stuff. Uh, Mr. Steffi, Bob Steffi. And he was very, the one thing he said at the beginning of the semester, he would say, to hell with being right. In other words, he encouraged what I, I use the term now with my uh, students. I got this from uh, Doug, Doug Lamov from Teach Like a Champion, is culture of error. Let's have a culture of error in the classroom where we, we work on things together, get, in, get into the discussion. And if you're not correct in what you say, that's okay. Mistakes as we know, a big part of how we learn. And so that was one thing that was dynamic about him in terms of his methodology and also him as a, a rhetorician or orator, 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 yeah. orator, or, or, orator, 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 mm -hmm. orange, orange. It doesn't sound right. You ever tomatoes. have a word that you say that you yeah. just doesn't sound right? Absolutely. No matter how you say it. And he was, he told a lot of stories and that got us involved too. And he was a very good storyteller and he had a very dry sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And that's, that really stuck and uh, stood out to me. How about you? And uh, oddly enough, that was something in regards to our personality test episode a couple of weeks back is that even if someone might not necessarily be the most flamboyant or charismatic or outgoing teacher, your Mr. Steffi was his name? Yeah, Mr. Steffi. Yeah, he sounded like he he utilized what he was good at which was storytelling and like you said even though he might have been more dry he was still very compelling when he, he, told, was. he told his stories yeah we think that if a teacher is not like mr keating from mm -hmm. dead poet yeah, society exactly. or, or that someone has to be that way in order to be engaging or dynamic i mean that's one way mm -hmm. i mean it's robin williams come sure. on but there's so many other ways too uh you don't have to raise your voice or scream or yell or run around the classroom to get uh, students' attention or to be dynamic or to be engaging. There's many ways, yeah. and like you said, according to people's personalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I've realized as I've reflected on my time is that I feel that when we were younger, at least speaking from my educational experience, that we had more projects when I was younger, maybe first through third grade, we had a good amount of projects. And then somewhere along the line, I'd probably say middle of middle school to the end of high school, a lot of it was very formulaic in terms of in math, we learned, I, I don't know how many times I went through algebra. In English, I don't know how many essays I might have written. In science, I don't know how many times you might have read through a textbook and done different things that were textbook related. And the majority of what I can remember from my education revolved around that. However, there were times when certain classes did stick out, like when we made a model rocket, when we made a project for my history class. Was when, it a rocket meant to take off? It was a rocket oh, meant really? to take off. So yeah, we had to figure out. What grade was this? Yeah, the engineering. This was probably seventh or eighth grade wow. from what I can remember. Like and, uh, Homer Hickam. Like, from, yes, exactly. October Sky. Yes, perfect example. And then when we got to college, some of the things that did stick out to me was when we did group projects or when we did projects that extended simply beyond just writing an essay, especially in an English class. And when I got to college and I got to my graduate degree, the instructors or the professors that stuck out to me were the ones who got us to do a bit more experiential learning. And this is something we'll talk about in an episode in the future is looking at these sort of things from this viewpoint of getting students to get up and do things. And, you know, we're talking about the things we've inherited. Pedro brought up a great example of a professor, an instructor who was very captivating through his storytelling. And that's something that we do inherit. We often, as we brought up before, we teach the way we were taught. We teach the things that we were inherited. And one thing I think a lot of instructors don't always do as they kind of go forward or they get started, whether this is due to fear or whether this is just due to complacency, is that they don't take as many risks in the classroom. Not to say that you have to take a risk every time to get through to your students, but a risk in regards to maybe a controversial topic you have the opportunity to talk about, a project that you can utilize that gets them to experience something different. 
And this is something we're going to kind of segue into, into the next half of the episode as we sort of look at the sort of new technology or the new ways of utilizing certain technology in the classroom going forward. So I'm going to take a quick commercial break, but Pedro, do you have something to add to that? Before yeah, before we, we go, I, I, I'm impressed that you're able to remember things that you did first through third grade. Well, not everything. Okay. I remember certain things that stick out. Yeah. Now, is it correct to call you as far as your generation? Are you a millennial? Would you call yourself that? What would you, what yeah, would you we, put yourself? I fall into the millennial category, but there's a, an extended branch from that. There's another name for the I think it was someone who was born between 1977 and 1986 or something that's part of the millennials, but they're also categorized differently. Not Generation Y. No, I'm Generation yes. X. Right, right, yes. So there's a, there's another, there's something in there that's, I, I read it, I forgot the name, but it kind of categorized us where we, something to the degree of, we saw the end of like VHS tapes, but we were exposed to it, but we were also you know, integrated into like modern technology a bit more smoothly than different generations. I've, and there's a specific name, uh, but I forgot. Maybe I can find it. So you're on the older side of millennial. Yes, I would be called on the older side of the millennial. Soon I will be the dinosaur of the millennial. It's okay. You're still younger than me. There you go. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we'll talk about some new technology uh, going your way. Hello everyone, what if there was a great place where you could network, learn, and apply your pedagogical knowledge? Well, fortunately for you, there is. College of DuPage will hold its annual Writing on the Edge conference on Saturday, October 20th. The theme for this year's conference is Composing Beyond Boundaries. Hear, learn, and examine the most modern discussions about methodology, classroom innovation, and faculty life in and outside of the world of academia. WOT is always working to link disciplines, colleagues, students, and communities, and would like to invite all instructors who use writing and multimodal practices in their courses. Find out more about WOT from their website at writingontheedge.org. Hope to see you there in October. All right, welcome back, everyone. Part two of this two-part episode in regards to old habits and new technology. So if you're just joining us or if you listen to the first part of this episode, you heard from myself and Peter as we discussed some of the old traditions and habits that we sort of hang on to, the type of teaching that we've inherited, and how we sort of pass that along to our students now. In this part of the episode, we have a returning guest, a friend of the show, a friend of mine, Karen Nguyen, is here hey, to talk about technology in class because now we're at this sort of tug of war in this current culture of ours where many modern instructors utilize technology. They're very technologically savvy, and so they like to sort of pass that on to their students as well. And for this part, we're going to kind of talk about some of the aspects of technology we like using, some of the sort of struggles we might have had with technology that we've seen with our students and with ourselves. Uh, and hopefully you can use some of these sort of advice and tips in your classes as well. So Carrie, welcome back. Thank you. Having me back. Yeah. You you you're becoming a good cameo, a staple of the show. <laughs> it's it's always good to have another perspective on here, especially with someone who works at both levels because I think that's it's a good sort of perspective to have. In regards to technology, what is what is your connection with technology? How do you use, you use it in your daily life? I use technology in my daily life, like outside of work. Mm -hmm. I just use my phone, keep up with people, message people, email. I check my email a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot from students, yeah. other teachers, admin. But it helped me connect with the world, really. So that's how I in my everyday life. So you, would, you see technology as more of a positive, connective presence? Well, for the most part, yes. Yeah. Uh, I do. There are other sides of technology where it's very invasive. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the word. It's people like to use technology and show everything they have through technology, sure. which I don't like. I'm very private at that part. Like mm -hmm. that part of my life. If you are a part of my life, you'll see that part of my life elsewhere. Like when we actually meet in real life. But otherwise, like I just use technology really just to keep up with people. 
not necessarily to like see what's going on in your life. Like sure. if I want to see what's going on in your life, I'll just call you. Yeah, or that, hang out with you. Yeah, I would. Yeah, totally agree. Because that's the the part of our culture now that many of these social networks have sort of created is that sort of voyeuristic, invasive, everything that you need to know about someone is made it's available. Not, yeah, right. it's available. Like I don't even need to call you up. If I, I can just go on Facebook or whatever and right. see what you've done for the day. Like yeah. I don't mm-hmm. really need to know all that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah and, and you know, and oddly enough, it's sort of ironic because we think that we have such a very transparent culture with all this technology, but at the same time, there is that sort of limited vision, because obviously you can post what you want, you can paint a particular picture of yourself, and it's not always necessarily the truth. And so technology, I would I would agree 100%. It's the most connective we've ever been in history. There's no doubt about it. Uh, oddly enough, I was just talking with one of my coworkers and, and my wife about it, was that we went to go see an ultrasound of our baby. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because I just looked and I'm like, you can see the the baby's bones and how they use just waves to take this picture on the inside of a person. And you see things going, heartbeats. I'm like, my God, what a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. It's just, to me, it's like, and then you think of smartphones and how intricate and what it like an engineering marvel a smartphone is just in itself. All the, the millions the of AI, pieces. Man. Oh, yeah. It's 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 incredible, and just to to think about everything the the hundreds of thousands of programmers that go into all this stuff that created it's like on a theological level. I was I was as I was talking with Peter about this off off mic was that I'm not I'm not a very religious person, but you think about how intricate certain things are that we've created as as people and you say to yourself and you c- contrast that and juxtapose that with like how intricate the universe is how intricate the human body is it's like man maybe something like us made us because as yeah, we yeah, did with yeah. this phone it's a very sort of interstellary sort of uh, observation but yeah just a bit of a side note there Transitioning over to your classes, in terms of your classes, do you have any examples of how you might have utilized technology in your classroom over the last year? I use technology in my classroom. Like we have a platform, like Canvas. It's like similar to maybe like a Google Classroom some people mm-hmm. are familiar with. But we have Canvas in our classroom. Um, and it's a kind of like a a platform where you can just put everything. So mm-hmm. for my classroom, I have announcements. So if you miss class, don't email me. I have a daily announcement. Like I'll post the daily agenda in, a, in the announcement. So just go in there, check what you, if you've missed it, this is what we did for the day. This is if you have any homework, this is what we turned in. I have it in announcements. There's a thing called like modules, like in, also in Blackboard, there's also like a module form where I just post things by units. Mm-hmm. So if we're doing unit one, we have this, if there's a PowerPoint for the day, there's a PowerPoint in there. If we're doing an activity with an assignment, like that's in there. Everything is auto-graded, which is, I love about technology is like you could make things auto-grade for you because I hate grading, mm-hmm. right? Everyone doesn't, doesn't love grading, but it needs to be done because you need to, you need to give some feed, feedback for yourself to know if the students are learning or not. So you need to grade something. Now, before you go any further, just in, in case anyone is uh, unfamiliar, what, when you say auto grade, what are you referring to? So if I have um, like a, a reading quiz, for example, uh, they could go in, I'm gonna give them some questions, there's answers and maybe it's multiple choice, maybe it's fill in the blank. I create the assessment, I put in the answers and if they type in the answer correctly or if they select the correct answer, the computer or program just automatically says yes or no and then calculates the points for me mm-hmm. it auto grades it i don't have to go through and take it home they press submit it auto grades they see their score feedback right away and they like that as well they like the immediate feedback of course like i said what a time to be alive what a time to be alive yeah, yeah so I, I have that on there so i have modules everything's on there if i have it saves me on handouts i don't have to print anything i don't have to like print a lot of stuff so i teach Mm -hmm. ap environmental and environmental so for me i want to save the trees so i don't want to print out a bunch of stuff everything if there's like a pdf i'll upload it if there's something that i could scan in and put in there as like a like if i have a worksheet and i want to just scan in so i don't have to make a bunch of copies that's in there all of my assessments instead of having a multiple like test print out i have it on all on canvas most of it's all on canvas there's rarely a time where I have anything like paper unless we're doing a lab or something that they want to actually write out like their data 
but otherwise it's mostly on canvas everything is on canvas there's a shared doc if you want to sign up for some kind of like research topic that we're doing there's a shared document first come first serve put your name in there you've got your topic secured mm -hmm. yeah if, if you've taught in any part of the institution high school college a lot of schools now have been transitioning over to a blackboard to a canvas and they've been trying to make them more user-friendly for a lot of instructors because they would prefer you to do all your work through that whether that's submitting your your classes activities their homework their essays their projects their quizzes and then that usually leads to a more immediate feedback like Carrie brought up which is something that many schools are trying to introduce or at least integrate because one it creates a, a need for less paper and at the same time there's more of a streamlined back and forth correspondence and it's more direct to you and your students and a lot of times it's just more organized I know that some some instructors might be a little weary of transitioning but really that's just in regards to anything everything that's technologically based is becoming more digital it's becoming more refined to either doing it directly from your phone your computer so some of these methods that are utilized are definitely more of a sort of pragmatic and efficient way to sort of do these modern day things. Yeah, like we had, um, I went to a PD, a professional development thing, uh, back in, I think, May or March, maybe. And it was really cool, they had a digital notebook. Like for science, you, the people stress like, oh, scientists keep notebooks. They keep everything handwritten in a notebook. But I feel like that's, that's kind of old school. Like you do, there is some correlation of, with you writing something and you retaining that information. But nowadays, like to have everything so digital, it's so much more neat. Mm -hmm. It's much more accessible. If you need to share something with somebody else, it's right there. You could send that page, you could send the whole book. So there was a cool thing that I went to. It's a um, digital notebook through OneNote, which is the Office, Microsoft Office program. And it's super awesome. It's, I, I would love to do my own, like do my own like trial with OneNote. It's kind of like a canvas or a blackboard, but what's great about OneNote is you could do it off the cloud. So you don't have to, like if your Wi-Fi is down and you can't do anything, it's fine. If you've uploaded what you wanted to do for the day to everyone's notebooks, to all of the, your class notebooks, then you don't have to worry about the, the network being down, which I, which I found really helpful and, and useful if you were to convert everything through. Yeah, I, that's one of those things that's much more effective now is just the ability to get instant access to everybody or give a certain amount of information directly to your class at once. And just a little tip that Carrie brought up, anytime you have a chance to take a professional development course, highly recommended, especially if it's a tech course, whether they're teaching you how to use a particular program, whether they're teaching you how to do something that you might have just skimmed over, like Carrie just sort of brought up, that it's just a great way to just kind of keep learning and learning new things that will essentially eventually make your life easier, especially Definitely. when your school starts transitioning over to some of these newer platforms. One of the, the excursions I went on with Carrie last year is we went to the Botanical Garden and she had her class actually engage in a few different things and first and foremost if you are in the area if you happen to be and you get a chance check it out if you're a teacher even if you just if you like botany you like plants go there a lot of newness a lot of new features and it's beautiful it is and it's it's just it's just a wonderful amazing place to go but the area that we went to for the field trip they had a updated sort of lab they had newer materials and the class was just engaged the entire time it was very interactive and carrie if you maybe just want to give a little bit of insight into what you had them do after we sort of broke away from that what was the way that they kind of kept in touch with you how did they kind of go about this sort of activity you had them doing okay so the activity afterwards i had them do like an extra credit activity and for them, they had to pick a plant, an economic plant, tell me the genus species of the plant, the origin of the plant, and how it affects the economy in some way. So if it was an ornamental plant, if it was something that was a decorative plant or maybe a crop plant, they have in any of the areas, the botanical garden, they had to tell me how much it affected the economy in some way. 
so for them to do this, they we have um, this app to keep in touch with me. We have we use this app called Remind One Hundred and One. I think it's Remind One Hundred and One, but it's Remind app. So if you look up Remind, uh, the students sign up through the Remind app either through a code or through like an email that you can send out to them, and it's basically like a text messaging service. So you don't use your own phone number because you don't want your students to have your own phone number. Sometimes maybe, but most of the time, no, you don't want your own phone number out to your students. But th- through this app, the app gives you the teacher a phone number and the students can communicate back and forth through this app. Um, so the students went out throughout the, the gardens and they picked a plan, they sent back their, uh, their information to me through this Remind app. It's great because I use the Remind app not only because they're on their phones all the time anyway, right? Mm-hmm. They're on their phones if you're like, you know, transitioning between stuff, they're going to check their messages or go on Snapchat or, or whatever. So they always have their phones. So I use Remind not only for that that instance where they have to send me back some information if they're doing this extra credit but i do it for it to remind them if there's a test coming up next like tomorrow like just to remind you guys we have a test tomorrow or um if we're doing a lab like any pre-labs or something hey guys something's due but it's also available if they have questions for me because i don't check my email like my my phone buzzes if i have an email but it's not less it's i'm not really going to check it after a certain point in time mm-hmm. but i will get a message that will just pop up. So I'll say like one of my students had text messaged you about a question. So it's most of the time they'll question like, hey, I can't find this. Like, where is it? Or like, hey, can you open this assignment or something like that? Or like, hey, what do I, where do I go to, to look for something? So like questions related to school most of the time. But it's it's easier way to communicate back and forth. It's something they're used to. They're used to texting. Um, they're not very email etiquette. Sadly. Yeah, one, one of the jokes I <laughs> the jokes I always make is that these kids there, and I say these kids like I'm an old man. Yeah, like you're an old yeah, man, but, but I say these kids yeah, too. Yeah, these kids they're on their phones and they could probably rifle through five or six different social networks and use their phone for all these different things. And it comes to email, it's like you're asking them to use an abacus to solve a math problem. Yeah, and. What was really cool about this particular extra credit activity that Carrie had them participate in was that they would go and they would, you know, they would break off into their groups and then they would find their particular plants. And at the same time, instead of writing a report by hand or physically doing things or having to run back to Carrie to ask a question, they could snap a picture. They could ask, hey, does this plant belong here? Is this plant part of this particular species? Does this count for something? Right. Um, And it was just it was such a quick way to stay connected and stay the, the classroom is extended and exactly they're not, and they're not right in front of you, correct basically. yes right but it's also i know it's also a way just to keep track of everyone without having to keep like a physical leash yeah. on these kids but at the same time they're engaged they're doing work they're learning they're experiencing they're going out and as we as, as we're going to talk about in a future episode with experiential learning That is the way that a lot of modern technology, or sorry, a lot of modern education is shifting to get kids to experience things and learn outside of simply what they would do uh, in a textbook. And this, I think, was a great example of that, especially because you actually had kids going out and seeing these things firsthand asking questions, getting sort of rebounded answers and saying, nope, that's not it, go find something else, and then having them actually physically explore the area to do so. So it's not like they're just going around and looking on a field trip and not listening to some tour guide. They're actually going around and having to learn because they're trying to figure out, does this meet the criteria that Miss Nguyen put out there? Carrie, anything else to add to this sort of technology discussion before we move along here? Technology is is great and technology is not great. I think you just have to be able to balance how you want to integrate into your classroom. How much you want to use it in your classroom is up to you and what you're comfortable with. But don't be, I would say, be so against it. I would say just be open to it because it will help you in your classroom. It will help your students and help you be more efficient with your time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more in regards to why we should use technology and not to say that we should dismiss many of the old actually not old many of the traditional <laughs> many of the traditional ways of giving information and, and um, taking inf- information right and just teaching yeah. that the goal isn't to necessarily say that you have to have one in order to eliminate the other or that one is a substitute for another no there's a harmony you can have a marriage yeah, between you can have those a mix. things 
but the goal as you for as an instructor is to determine how it works best for you right like with peter earlier in the episode his class is primarily a philosophy based class it's more conversational it's more is suited in a way that goes back thousands of years to the time of, of plato and socrates and the way that they did it as the ancient greeks and romans in did form. right in, in a form, form right yeah and now we're in a very different time where you can use technology harmoniously in, in sync with many of these traditional and classical pedagogical methods. And so when we come back next time on Classroom Hacks, we will be talking about experiential learning. One of the people that uh, I followed quite a bit was Anthony Bourdain. And in his passing, he has taught us that there is no substitute for learning when the world is your classroom when you have the ability to experience different things walk in someone else's shoes there's no substitute for what you can gain from that sort of perspective so the next time we come back and we talk with you we'll be talking about experiential learning until then arrivederci and we bid you adieu Hello, everyone. Just wanted to remind all of our wonderful listeners that you can find exclusive Classroom Hacks content on our respective social media platforms. You can find daily advice, information, motivation, and hilarity all for free. So find, follow, like, and enjoy Classroom Hacks on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.